And hearing how people try and describe the sounds, we heard it, Mandy struggling with Bjork's visual descriptions of what sounds she wants. And not my talk's really about everyday sounds and the words we use to describe them. And if you were actually to uh, come up to my lab, you might come and do sort of kind of some perceptual testing. Here is a listening room up at Salford University. And we might be comparing these loudspeakers. And if we really wanted to understand which loudspeaker sounded better than the other and why, we'd probably reach for specialist vocabulary. Some of the terminology that we've heard around this room, terms you wouldn't use outside a group of audio and acoustics people. And I'll give you an example of that specialist category we've got here. This is actually uh, not mine, this is from uh, Delta, a company across in Denmark. And it's a sound wheel, it's a bit like a colour wheel. And some of those terms are probably, I don't know, a bit small to see, so it's the best quality one I could get. Some of those terms will be familiar, things like hissing, but some of them are very, uh, very sort of kind of focused on things we'd use, like next to hissing we have compressed. So we tend to use specialist vocabularies when we try to describe things within our own community. But what do everyday people use when describing sound? And for me, one of the things that's really interesting about it is it gives some insight into cognition. Now, as Brett also mentioned, I wrote a popular science book, and this is why I started getting really interested in this language issue. So Sonic Wonderland, for those who don't know, the premise is I'm going around the world looking for the most amazing sound in the world. This is a book you can buy in paperback. It, hasn't, it doesn't come complete with sounds and headphones. So in that book, when I was writing it, I had to describe the sounds. And this is not an academic text. This is a book aimed at the general public. So I thought I'd give you a competition and play some of the sounds I met and see how good you are at trying to describe them. So for the second time today, we have the Mojave Desert. We had it earlier on. We had a rattlesnake and a rat, wasn't it, in the Mojave Desert. This is Kelso Dunes in the Mojave Desert. Um, and this is a singing sand dune. So you may have heard about these dunes that hum or drone. Um, and they have a really peculiar sound when you walk on them. So this is... Uh, uh, you, they're quite rare, partly because they're in deserts and you have to go and visit in the summer, so not many people are looking for them. Uh, this is about 40 degrees Celsius where this picture has been taken. But they have this really weird sound when you walk on them, and the literature talks about a belching sound. I was content that maybe not the best description. But anyway, I want to see what you think it should be described as. Down here, if you walk down here, it just sounds like a sand dune, unless you're walking on any old sand dune. It's on this side where you get this rather peculiar sound. How would you describe this? Oh, we've been terribly interactive today. You, you started off, didn't you? So, I hope that's your audience. It sounds like a tuba. Yeah, it's yeah. like a tuba. God, well, isn't that marvellous? Because guess what I called it? Played like a badly played tuba. Look at that. We're, we're all, we're all um, yeah, so it's quite interesting. I, I, uh, this is the description for a book. Um, so I do use an onomatopoeia, and a lot of my talks are going to be about onomatopoeia, so I talk about honking. Uh, but I also end up using a simile, which is often what we end up doing in English. We often end up using similes or maybe metaphors, because actually we don't have a very rich uh, vocabulary of onomatopoeia in English. And it's kind of one of the curious things. And you can read the description a bit later on why I try to get a bit more poetic about it. But yeah, a bit like a musical instrument. And in fact, that's how um, um, I think, if I remember rightly, Marco Polo kind of described his experiences. Let me turn it the other way around. So this is the Inchin Down Oral Depot, where I, I um, measured this with a gunshot. So I was measuring the reverberation time or, uh, because it, uh, to prove it had the Guinness World Records longest uh, reverberation time. And I'm going to start by actually showing you how I described it, and then you can see if I think you think my description is any good at all. So this is a really weird space. It's much bigger than it looks. So it's a quarter of a kilometre long, and it's actually tunnelled out the side of... It's up near Inverness. It's tunnelled out the side of a Scottish mountain. There's five of these alongside each other. Each of them is absolutely vast. And it was for shipping oil, and they were meant to be bomb-proof. And they were very bomb-proof. And that's one of the reasons it's got the most amazing sound in them. And so here's how I described it. If the world ends with an apocalyptic thundercrack, there's a, a, a on our pier, this is what it will sound like, with the rumble lingering and forlornly dying away. My wife and I had a disagreement about whether that was metaphorical or simile. Maybe someone who knows English better can tell me the answer. But anyway, um, did I get the description right? Here's what it sounds like. <laughs> Now, I'm going to 
to cut across it because the recording's over a minute long and I'm sure we'll get bored listening to it. How do you think I did? Well, how, how would you describe it? I think Apocalypse might be too strong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you crank it up or if you're near the gun, I tell you it is. Right. <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts? Oh yeah, there's tons of bass which we're not getting out of here. Oh, right. So, uh, for the technical people, 63 hertz has got three minute reverberation time. Right. There's a lot of bass. <laughs> it's the loudspeakers here. And I'll tip you a third and the final one. So this is a bearded seal. Um, and actually I've pointed at this by Chris Watson, the um, natural history recordist or sound artist or BBC presenter, how you may, many people in the room probably know Chris. And he said these bearded seals got the most remarkable sounds. I'll give you his description in a moment. I've cut this one short as well, because the calls of these last about half a minute to a minute long, and it's a bit long to do. Um, so I'll just give you the start of this is this bearded seal swimming around in the Arctic underwater calling to a mate. Yeah, so actually Chris's description, and he, he says it's cliché, is a choir of alien angels. And actually it's interesting because often what, when going around and trying to write descriptions, my first draft of the book would talk about things sounding peculiar or interesting, and then you realise that doesn't tell the reader anything. So you then reach for something that actually possibly gives the reader something to latch on to. An alien appeared so often in my first draft, my editor started complaining about it. Because I was looking for these very remarkable sounds, and a lot of remarkable sounds sound unnatural. So they sound alien. So I think this is the only mention of alien that still remains in the book. <laughs> Every other, 20 other descriptions of alien sounds dis disappeared during the edit. Um, so what's interesting here, I think, um, is that we don't have a very rich, rich vocabulary of some of these onomatopoeia terms. And um, just as a little hint, if you ever write a book like this, that's actually what you need to get. You need to get a long list of them. This is out of the Oxford Thesaurus. Someone back in the 90s um, actually made a whole list of 100 of them. This is much longer. And I, I had this next to my computer when I was writing to tie it. How can I come up with a word I haven't used already? There we are, this complete kind of list. But this, this was kind of a few years ago I wrote the book. And more recently, we've been looking at onomatopoeia in a research project. And what we're interested in is how people categorise sounds and what words they use for categories. The reason I'm interested in how people categorise sound is because you think about, we talked quite a bit about neuroscience at various points and what the brain does in it today. One of the things we do is we don't just pattern match, which I think was the description we talked about. We categorise things. You're, you're listening to me. You've already clocked I'm an academic. I'm white. I'm middle-aged. I've got a southern accent. You've already started to stick me in a category so you know how to deal with me when I might come talk to you later on. And uh, the same thing happens with lots of sensory information. We stick things in categories. It's part of our processing, which is very important. So we're asking about categorical, uh, pro, uh, categorical use of uh, how we place sounds because it might give us insight into cognition. So let me give you a task. Pretend there are five real cards on the table and I ask you to put them into two groups. Again, we'll make this interactive as we're following the theme of today. Anyone like to suggest a group you might put a couple of cards into? Clatter and rattle. Clatter and rattle. Why clatter and rattle? Because it sort of suggests repeated repetitive. Yeah, they've got similar sort of kind of sound to yeah. them. Any other suggestions? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and why? Because uh, you know, it's a hissy sort of sound, but they have got high frequencies. Okay. You know. So we've got a description of sound types. What about the top line? Would you, would you possibly put hiss? We had a rattlesnake earlier on. Would you put hiss and rattles together because they're both sounds that snakes make? Did I say that right? Sounds the same. I think I did. Anyway, uh, so the end of a lay long day. Um, so you can group them. I've deliberately picked a load of things which have different categorization possibilities. But you can categorize them according to the sound. So you could put clatter and clap together because they've got clutter sounds in them. Or your idea of rattle and clatter have got similar sort of qualities. Or you can categorize according to the source hiss and rattle because of snakes, or hiss and sniff because they're both vocal sounds that humans make, for example. So you can categorise on the peers in different ways, and we were interested in looking at that, and specifically the research question we wanted to say, is do people categorise these on the matter according to the sound source, what they think is making the sound, or actually according to the physical qualities of the sound, the fact that rattle and clatter have a kind of similar sound quality. 
Now, why, why are we interested in this? Well, it's something that people have looked at in other areas. So if I was to take you outside onto, say, Exhibition Road, and to ask you to describe the soundscape that you're in, and just tell you, what you what, what, what's around you? Tell us about the sound. The thing you would tend to do is you would tend to identify the sound sources. So you would tend to go, there's a car there, I can hear people talking, I can see a fountain, or I can hear a fountain would be more appropriate. You're unlike to go sort of brum brum, you know, crack, crack, you know <laughs> hubble bubble, whatever they feel saying, trickle trickle. You know, you're not going to describe the sounds as in their characteristics, you're first going to identify sources. And uh, so we're interested to see if that happens with onomatopoeia. Now, onomatopoeia are a really interesting class of sound. I'm not a linguist, so we've got linguists in the room that can correct me if I get this wrong. They have what's called iconicity, because the actual sound they make when you say the word relates to their meaning. So there's a direct relationship to the sound the word makes and the meaning. So they're a really interesting class of sounds. And actually, uh, of, there's a bigger super class of these things called idiophones. And uh, uh, onomatopoeia is a particularly I iconic set of these. And so it's a very interesting thing that mostly in language, most of the words we use to describe things are pretty arbitrary. You know, the actual term description for chair is pretty arbitrary or ceiling. It's just kind of what that word actually is doesn't really relate to the meaning. But actually, in onomatopoeia, it's actually not true. So here's the experiment. Uh, we ran it online. I don't know if the left-hand ones are, are clear, but these are all cards. Chirp, plash, thud, pop, roar, slash, lash, butter. There's a whole list. There's 50 of them there, onomatopoeia. And in this task, what we do is get people to pull those sounds into five groups and give each group a label. And that's all you have to do. It's quite a fun thing to do. It takes a bit of time, probably about a 20-minute task to do. But you can imagine in old times, you'd actually have these printed on cards and you'd be doing it on the table. It's actually slightly easier to run online, so we ran it as an online experiment. So I'm going to show you what happens as a result. I'll talk a bit later about how we get to that result. I'll give some hints as to the process. But what we're trying to do is look across this group of people we worked with, and the results I'm going to show you have between 50 and 100 people doing the task. On average, how do they group them together? And this is what happens with onomatopoeia. So you can see there's, there's three groups. Uh, don't worry about the dimensions. We'll talk about those a bit later on. But we've got a red group, a green group, and a blue group. And um, they have different characteristics to them. So uh, what are those groups and what, what, how would you label them? Well, I can try and look at them and go hum, suck, hiss, what they are. But of course, we ask people to write group labels in their top boxes. So we can look at how people actually label themselves. So these are the actual labels, the top three labels for each of these groups. So you can see that in the red, we have a load of human, animal and vocal sounds. Cough, grunt, sniff, hum, suck, giggle. They're all kind of like that. Uh, in the blue group, we've got sounds which people label as loud, aggressive, and violent. They're all kind of impact sounds. They're bang, crash, boom, rumble, thump. What's rather amusing as well, the second appearance of Trump today in the loud, aggressive, and violent group. <laughs> I don't, um, there we go. I don't know how many people did this uh, for other reasons. But anyway, these are all, sort of, I call them impact sounds, but loud and aggressive sounds. And then you've got a, high, a description in green here of things like click, zip, pop, ding. They're high pitch, they're short. And they're often quite technical sounds in how people kind of describe them. So if you remember our question is, what, is this about the source of the sound, or is it actually about the sound of the onomatopoeia? So if we look, I've labelled them. The bottom left-hand one, which is all audible uh, sort of vocal sounds, clearly the sounds are really different. Roar is very different to suck, to giggle, to whisper. There's no real common acoustic feature of these words. So they are grouping the red ones according to the source, not the sound on average. The green one is kind of the other way around. A lot of these are high-pitched sounds, they're short sounds, and therefore people are using the acoustic characteristics of the word, if they were to say them out loud, to do this grouping, and not the source on the whole. The blue group, I, when I first put this up, I thought, oh, it's all about the sounds, because crash, bang, wallet, they're all kind of similar kind of sounds. But I think we've got to remember that a lot of these sort of impact sounds create similar kind of sounds. So it could be about sources, it could be about sounds. I'm not quite sure how you separate them because these kind of sounds tend to have a similar sound feature to them anyway, so they're hard to separate. So that's onomatopoeia, which we were kind of looking at. And so what we're seeing is people clustering these according to the source, sometimes the sound they're hearing, and possibly a mixture. So how is that categorization being done? Well, our hypothesis is it's being driven by the most simple and most unambiguous way to do that categorization task. So we're splitting people into groups. You're putting me in sort of my pigeonhole. You will pick a categorization which works and is efficient. 
And the same must be true of sound. That's the hypothesis. We're not sure how to test that. And actually, going back to the very first talk we had this morning, I think this is due to the evolution of hearing. Because as was pointed out first thing this morning, um, actually, hearing is much older than speech and music. Hearing, I mean, if you take mammalian hearing, it depends on whether you want to have a cutoff, but let's say 125, 200 million years old, maybe roughly sort of a mammalian hearing age. Uh, so hearing is first and foremost about early warning rather than about the communication with speech and language. And that has consequences. So imagine I'm out on the savanna and something's creeping up on from me from behind. I have vision to the front. I don't have very good smell. Being a human, we have to have terribly good smell. How do I know danger is coming from behind is purely about sound. So we have really good perception of sound, a very high accurate localization. But what's going to be most un unambiguous way of describing the problem? If I go Russell, Russell, that's not as clear as going there's a tiger behind you or whatever it might be. So we unambiguously try and get to the sources because that tells us how to respond, how our fight or flight or whatever our response might be. Now, this could explain why English seems to have a relatively poor set of these onomatopoeias. Um, because it seems, I'll put that word in appears, because there's a really in interesting study going on at the Max Planck Institute at the moment, where they're looking across cultures at lots of different idiophones, this superclass of, of onomatopoeias, and they're trying to see if this is true. They're trying to see if there's actually a different uh, sets of uh, uh, a richness of sound description. But there seems to me a very good biological and evolutionary reasons why we will describe according to sound source and why, therefore, we'll end up with descriptions which are about sources and not actually about the, the sound quality themselves. So that's a, a speculation uh, about English. But it certainly was true when I wrote my book that what I found was people tend to describe things by sources. You tend to use simile and metaphor. It's easier. Using onomatopoeia, there's a long list of 100, but loads of them people actually wouldn't know. So that kind of technique we've also used to look at other cases as well. And I wanted to particularly look at uh, this particular paper, and I'll put a few of my colleagues along here involved on, on this particular project. And if this really interests you, you could look up a, uh, a, a paper we've got coming out soon in Frontiers of Psychology. Oh, hopefully coming out. It's not being reviewed yet. That's very presumptuous. The paper in Frontiers of Psychology, which is going to crash and burn in review, or whatever it might be now. We're, we're writing it up at the moment. Um, where we've done a very similar task, and we're, again, we're asking this, category, this question about how people categorise sounds. And what words do people use? Because it really tells us, gives us an insight into uh, some cognitive processes. So what we did, we, again, we uploaded loads of sounds, about 50 in this list here. And you'll notice some are labelled one and two, because there's more than one, one wind example, for example. We've got wind, and, uh, wind one, wind two. We load it up onto the website. I think 50 people took part from in this particular study. We asked people just to stick those in categories. And you might think, as you're looking there, how you might stick them together into different categories and make them into five categories and label them. Some of the tests I'm showing you come going forward, they actually listen to sounds as opposed to just having the words. Sometimes it's just on the cards. It depends on what we're trying to achieve. So once you get that data, you get this what's big thing called a contingency table. So a contingency table down the vertical axis, down the column, you can see we have 60 sounds. I obviously haven't put all 60 sounds on there because they won't fit on the screen. But there's a big table 60, 60 rows long. And then along the uh, horizontal, we have all the different groupings that people did. 50 people, everyone did five groupings, we have 250 descriptive terms. And then, basically, if you put the word advert in a group called people, I'm oh, sorry, uh, pleasing, then you can see this person, there's one person put the group in pleasing, or you can see alarm one went in the group called alarms by this person here, and you can see a table which reflects whether something is in a group or out of group, and that's what a contingency table is. Now, if you look at our contingency table, you'll see that some people use the same group names, which is hardly surprising. So we're going to put those together. And then you'll see that some people are using terms which are almost identical, nature and natural. So we'll stick those together. And then you get a synonym dictionary out. Um, and then you look for synonyms like bells and chimes. And you stick those together to try and collate this down to a smaller table. And so you end up with a table like that, which instead of having zeros and ones in, has zeros, ones, two, three, four, and, and, and higher numbers. So what does this table tell you? It tells you when sounds are similar. So if you look, we've got a row of children and crowd here, and you'll notice that 13 of the children went in a group called people, and 14 of the 
sorry, did I say 13 of the crowd went to a group called People, and 14 of the children went to a group called People. These are obviously related sounds. So if you see a pattern along here of zeros and numbers which is similar, that's telling you the two sounds are similar to each other, because they've been put into similar groups. So actually, the, how similar each of those rows looks tells you how similar a sound is. And you can do an analysis which is called a contingency analysis to actually look at these in more detail. And that's how I produced that plot you saw earlier on, on those couple of dimensions. You can also do a cluster analysis. Now, if anyone's here who does stats, it's a bit more multidimensional scaling. It happens to be done with categorical data, hence it's called a contingency analysis, but it's the same kind of idea. So let's do that on this and process it. You stick it for a stats package. And we had one of these. In fact, I don't have to say what these are, because Brett introduced one only in the last talk. You get a, a dendrogram which shows how sounds are grouped together. So in my plots, the sounds all along here, children, crowd, sneeze, laughter, laughter, advert, vendor, they're all the sounds we just saw listed earlier on. And we have them in groups. You can decide where to slice it. There's ways in the analysis of deciding if I did it here, I'd have three groups. If I did it down here, I'd have one, two, three, four groups. You have to decide how many groups you want to look at at any one time. And in this particular analysis, we're going to start off by looking at this level, because this is where kind of analysis indicated a good split to be. So we can see it splits into three groups. Well, how do we label these three groups? Again, we could as experimenters look at those and make decisions, but we're interested in what sounds, what, what terms do people use spontaneously? So I don't want to impose the words, I want to look at what people said. So if we look at the words that people used in this group, and we can just see a table, don't worry about too much about percentages, these are all the words people use to describe people, music, vocal, entertainment, clatter, chatter, sorry, going down. So these are the terms that people typed in those top boxes. People was used much more often than any other word to describe those sounds. And therefore, we stick people to describe that particular branch. We do that same for the other branches. We get pe people, nature, and man-made as being the first branch of sounds. If these are sounds of the city, really. These are soundscape sounds. We shouldn't be really too surprised by that because there's been lots of studies, for example, showing how na natural sounds are different to other sounds. And I'll give you an example of one of those kind of studies. So here is a, 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 is a study, you can sit down at the bottom, where they played the sound of uh, cars on a wet road to people when they were in a, a brain imaging scanner, one we saw at, uh, at the earliest, uh, earliest talk, an fMRI scanner, and they looked at which parts of the brains were involved, whether people were told it was cars on a wet road, or whether they were told it was a beach. Actually, they used the same sound, they just switched what they told it was, they didn't actually tell them that. Um, and uh, so I'll play you them two sounds, because I don't know if you've heard them. They could be quite similar. Uh, these, these are not quite identical, but you can work out which one is which. Is this the beach? Or is this the beach? One day I edited them closer together so people won't know. But you all feel smug because you recognised it, don't you? So that's good. Made the audience feel good. But they play this. And what's interesting is, depending on what you say the sound is, the actual parts of the brain recruited for the processing change. So it's interesting when we talk about clustering. What we have found in our clusters is we end up with particular clusters just by card sorting, which gives us insight into maybe what's going on in the brain. And we know that there's a division between natural sounds and man-made sounds which goes back to all this sort of stuff you've seen uh, on things like nature being good for you, nature helping you recover uh, from illness quicker and all those kind of stuff. So if you have the full dendrogram with all the different labels on, uh, you can see it there. And what we were then interested in is to look in a bit more detail at different parts of this. And that's what I want to finish up on. So we had this soundscape sorting, and then we did two extra separate sortings. One on nature, so we got 50 natural, natural sounds. One on man-made, we've got 50 different man-made sounds. I'm going to flip past the dendrograms very quickly because they take a long time to read. But for example, there's the natural sound. You can see birds, mammals, weather, forest. So another 50 people did that task. Another 50 did the man-made sounds. And then we also looked right down at the lowest level. So we have done a surprising number of experiments on dog sounds. And this, uh, uh, this is car engines down there, uh, related to the road. So again, we had 50 sounds that we sorted, which were all to do with dogs. And you can see the top level, if you want to know how to categorise your dog, for dog lovers. Is it howling, yappy, or growling, would be how they describe, or maybe yours got aggressive and deep. Uh, so there's the description of dogs. 
And for car engines, does your car chug or does it hum? You can decide that's the kind of division. So those are the kind of divisions. So we now have categorizations at whole city level in terms of sounds, all the way down to different dog sounds at different kind of levels. Now what's interesting is the categorization strategy varies through those levels. So the way we brain decides to categorize them seems to be different. And I'll just take you through some examples of conscious of time, so I won't be too much longer. Um, so we don't have to worry too much about it at the moment just looking at this. I just want to look at the colors. So what we've done is these are some of the terms that people have used here. So you see clicks, machine, inanimate, man-made. So these are soundscapes, harmony, marine, footsteps. You know, these are just different descriptions of words. And they're split into three colors. So effect means uh, effect words, which kind of relate to emotion in some way. You've got things like unpleasant, for example. Signal relates to, we're going back to, is it rattle or clatter? It's some property of the acoustic signal. So we've got things like humming, rumbly, percussive. And source is actually about what makes a sound. So you've got things like industrial, electronic, entertainment, and those things. And you'll see at the level of the soundscape, so look at the sounds of the city, that it is predominated by source sounds, which is what I told you earlier on we've, we've been found in soundscape research before. Go out in the city, people name the sources of the sound, and that's how people categorise them. There's a really interesting consequence for this for people doing research in soundscapes, is because quite often people go to the city and get them to score things on emotional scales. Because we're all emotional animals, we must respond in an emotional way. Notice how few emotional terms are used to describe sounds in our, in our category. So is that the best way of doing it? Some interesting sort of um, methodological challenges. So I'm going to skip past the level, middle level and go right down to dogs, I think is the next one. So we're going right down to dogs at the lower level. And it's changed. So you can see there's much more green, much less blue, and much more red. That means there's a lot more of these emotive terms, the effective terms gunning out, like distressed, bored, nice, aggressive coming out. Signal features, there's some here. And blue, which is the source, there's much fewer. So when we come to look at categorising dogs, we seem to actually be dealing with them on a much more emotional level, probably anthropomorphising the dog and dealing with them in that way. And in fact, for those who, who in, in psychology, you can actually, these dimensions we've got, you can actually relate them to valence, which is unpleasant to pleasantness. There's a score, uh, and you get quite a nice correlation there. And you can also relate them to arousal, which is how excited things are as well comes out of that data as well. So it seems with the dogs, the categorization is driven by our effect, by our emotional response. But that's not true of all of them. So if we look at engines, then we get a different story. So engines, there's very few emotive terms, despite what Jeremy Clarkson might like to think. Uh, there aren't very many. What we're getting is a lot of signal terms, hum, low, rattle, monotonous, and, and we're still getting quite a lot of source terms as well. So the categorization here, the thing which we can definitely talk about is signals. It's about the sound quality, which I guess Jeremy Clarkson would be glad to hear. It's about the sound quality of the engines that we hear. And again, we can look across these dimensions and relate them to what's going on. So you tend to see dimension one is about whether things are fluctuating or steady. So steady down this end of the graph and up here, we've got things like stuttering and chugging. So we're categorising them according to where it's going ch -ch 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 or kind of that kind of effect. What's interesting here is there's nothing about acceleration, deceleration, braking, gear changes, which are all in these sound files. No one bothered categorizing with that on average. Uh, and then the other dimension is brightness. So brightness, interesting, we're recruiting a, a, something about vision here, but brightness is about how much light, high frequency is compared to low frequency. So stuff on the left-hand side tends to be muffled, and this is not clearly bright, but it's obviously not muffled, might be described. So to bring this all back together and give you a, a sort of kind of summary, what we have is we have distinct strategies for categorization across lots of cognition, and that's true of sound as well. But what it seems we're getting insight into is those categorizations are different, and it depends on the type of sound and also at what level you're trying to do it. And the pattern, you know, these are, we've got a few more sorting tasks we've done, but we're only just got scraping the surface. So I can't give you a story about exactly how we determine what strategy is used in case. But all we're seeing is different strategies. And I, I, the other thing I'd like to say, because it kind of fits with the sort of the, the, the theme of today being about sound and language, is language can really give us this categorization task and give us insight into the, the cognitive processes. And we're going on in this project to look at things like prototypes in recognition and stuff like that. But that's me finished.